Good afternoon, good morning, everyone, wherever you're joining us from. I'm Yuri Tarika Magyar, the Eurocess country representative from Japan. I would like to welcome you uh, to our webinar today on publishing a scholarly book. Our speaker is uh, Katie Fees, who is the publisher for Social Sciences and Humanities, books for Rutledge in Asia. She's going to talk about how to publish your first book, or giving ideas about how to publish a book uh, with their company. And this talk is going to guide you through everything that you need to know about uh, publishing from the manuscript to the actual steps that you need to follow during the process. Uh, thank you very much, Katie, for joining us. And uh, let me just give uh, the floor to you. I'll switch myself off. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that introduction. Hopefully, you can just confirm that you can see my slides. Can you see the how to cut published yes. slides? Yes, it's in full screen mode. And uh, yes, Excellent. your result. Thank you. OK, fantastic. Well, thanks ever so much um, to everyone for attending today. And thank you to Judith and your access for inviting me to um, speak to you. Um, as she mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about um, how to publish a research uh, scholarly book. Um, I'll probably talk for about 45 minutes. Um, everything I say today is relevant to most of the large publishers, um, academic publishers, although obviously I'd like you to publish a book with um, Routledge. You can take what I'm saying here today um, and go and publish with one of the other um, major publishers if you choose. Um, just to give you a little bit of background of who I am, I'm the publisher for Routledge um, Social Science and Humanities books. I'm based in our Singapore office. I actually normally travel to Japan uh, at least two or three times a year. Obviously, I haven't been able to visit this year, which is a real shame. Um, and I hope as soon as we can get a bit more travel going between Japan and Singapore, I'll be out to visit you all again um, soon. But we have a, a, a large number of Japanese authors um, at Routledge, and I work with um, many of those. But I have a whole team who are based here uh, in Asia Pacific, uh, in Australia, in Singapore, in Beijing, in Japan, uh, in um, all parts of Asia. And we work across the whole of the social science humanities. I've worked in publishing for about 17 years, uh, both in books and in journals. So I hope that you take this opportunity today to ans ask all the questions that you might have about the process, about copyrights, about permissions, anything that you might have um, a question on. I will take um, questions at the end. Um, so please do hold on to your questions for then, or you can type them in the chat box whenever you think of them through the presentation, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. So I'm just going to start the presentation by telling you a little bit about what we're going to present today. So I'll talk about who we are, who Routledge is. Then I'm going to move on to talking about how to propose a book, the review process, the publishing process, a little bit about open access in book publishing, um, a little bit about maximizing the research impact of the book that you do publish. And then, as I say, there'll be hopefully plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So Routledge is um, a very old company. We've been around since 1836, quite a long time before my, uh, my time. Uh, we publish uh, more than 5,000 new books every year, which sounds like a lot. The positive about publishing so many books is that we have the ability to publish some slightly more regional titles, slightly more narrow niche um, projects, which some of the other larger publishers wouldn't choose to um, go ahead with. We recognize that because we can offer the breadth of content, um, there is that opportunity for us to work with, particularly uh, scholars in parts of the world like um, Asia, where there hasn't always been the same opportunities as there have been for those in the West. So that's something that I'm really excited about. And my job is to try and encourage as many authors from Asia and Asia Pacific to publish with us as we can. And me and my team are really supportive of all um, scholars in the region. Um, we can help you with advice on language, um, how to ensure the language in English is uh, sufficient. We can give you lots of advice on how to approach um, your book project. So I'm hoping that you will be encouraged by um, the talk today. We published around two and a half 
to uh, 2,600 journals. Uh, we're ranked top five uh, global publishers in the world, and we're number one in social sciences. So we are obviously a very large publisher, um, and we've been around for a long time. So hopefully you feel that you're in safe hands with Routledge. We are actually owned by a publishing company called Taylor & Francis, um, and many of our journals are published under Taylor & Francis. So I only mention that so that you understand where Taylor & Francis and Routledge, um, how they meet. And then CRC Press is our STEM, is our science, um, technology, engineering, medicine um, brand for our book publishing. So we have those three brands that you'll hear um, when you're talking about publishing with Routledge. Like many large publishers, we have offices all over the world um, and we have a global sales and marketing reach. So if you do publish a book with us, we can make sure that we're at all the big conferences, virtually at the moment, but hopefully in person again very soon. We can make sure that we're mailing you know, huge numbers of people who are involved in the Routledge ecosystem. We can do lots of electronic and web marketing. We're lucky enough to have um, one of our uh, marketers, Christy Kennedy, on the call today will help me with the questions at the end. Um, we have a fantastic locally based uh, marketing team who are really supportive of all our, our Asian scholars. We have a really fantastic um, editorial and production um, staff and team who are there to guide you through the proposal and review process, through the copy, edit copy editing and proofing, um, and to make sure that the books are produced and look beautiful. It's something that Routledge is really um, uh, it really values and I know for Japanese scholars um, when you're publishing in local language in Japanese the books also look um, beautiful to to hold and I know that's quite important so we we definitely make sure that um, the books that publish the Routledge look um, and feel fantastic. Okay so where do I start if I want to uh, write a book? I think that's the the first thing to think about. Often this is people looking quite anxious about where to begin. I'm just going to start by talking about why a book and why in English, because I recognise that um, I'm very lucky to have been born um, in England. I'm a native English speaker, which makes my life a lot easier um, because obviously the, the, the main language of academia is English and um, it's much harder for academics who are not native English speakers to publish a whole book in English. But I do want to encourage you to try. And this is some of the reasons that I think it's important. So books are a core component for many universities and career progression. They do offer a chance to delve deeper and connect ideas together. In particular, you can publish a few journal articles, but unless somebody's read all of those journal articles, they may not be able to understand the, the bigger picture of your research, where a book can help you um, spread out all of the ideas that you have um, and connect them together and give you more space to really um, you know, really tell people what it is that makes your research special and unique. Um, and I think that's something that a book offers. Uh, that long form component, I think, is really important. Books are more widely available and accessible. You know, they're, they're available on Amazon on big commercial um, platforms. Uh, they're available in bookshops. You can buy them in, you know, if you're heading through an airport anytime soon, you can buy books there um, in any of the, the big bookshops, Kino Cunha and others. So I think books have a slightly different and more accessible uh, market than uh, a journal article. And they're also um, around for longer. Journal articles tend to go out of date after a couple of years. Um, books tend to stay around and be relevant if they're well written for five to 10 years as well. And, in, and why in English? I think it's important to think about your position as an academic and how you want to position and build your brand as an academic internationally. If you do want to build an international career and be invited to go to conferences and give keynotes and, and collaborate with other scholars outside of Japan, then publishing a book allows you to exchange your ideas internationally, build your global reputation. If you publish in local language, only the people who can read Japanese will be able to engage with your research. And so they aren't able to engage with you and start a conversation about your research, which you can do if you publish in English outside of your local network. You're just expanding the market for the research that you've done and potentially that can lead to citations and impact for the, the research that you've um, carried out. So I know it's not easy. Um, Routledge is willing to give you quite a lot of support um, and I you know, personally work with mostly non-native English speakers, so I, I'm really happy to support you and, and give you that help. But I do plea with you to try um, 
to try and, and publish a book in English if you can. Okay, so you've you've decided you've got a book, you've got um, a certain amount of research, perhaps you've done a PhD and you, you want to publish something from your thesis or you've written uh, a number of journal articles, you've done a big research project and you'd like to put that together in a book. The first thing you need to do is shape the idea for your book. So what is your book about? What exactly are you covering? You can't possibly cover everything that you've um, researched. You may need to be quite um, choosy in picking the two or three kind of big ideas that you want to tell um, a global audience about. So start to shape what the story that you're trying to tell is. Um, and then think about who you're writing the book for. I will talk about this quite a lot because who you're writing your book for is really important. You need to be thinking about why the audience that you're writing that book for needs your book. Why would they want it? It's not enough for you to think, in my career at this stage, I would like to write a book or I need to write a book. What you need to think about is the audience that you're writing the book for, the readership. Why do they need the book that you're going to write? What will make them buy it? What will make them read it? What will make them cite the book? And if you can't think of a compelling reason that makes your book better than the competition, the other books out there, um, then it's it's possibly not the right book idea. So really have quite a lot of um, conversations with yourself, with colleagues in the field, um, in your department, for example, about your idea. Do they think it's a valuable idea? Do they think that they would read that book or buy that book? If you can, talk to other scholars published in the same field and series editors of book series about the idea and get feedback as much as you can. And if you're lucky enough to meet someone like me, a commissioning editor, um, perhaps you know, we may come to a university or perhaps somebody will email you and, and start to engage with you on your research, then have a conversation with a commissioning editor like myself about your idea. We're really happy to talk to you at an early stage about the idea that you have for a book. It doesn't have to be a whole manuscript. It doesn't even have to be the full proposal for a book. But I'm really happy to have those conversations about what you're thinking you'd like to write a book on. And I can give you advice and guidance about how to proceed. Um, I will give my email address at the end of this presentation and I do encourage you to reach out to me and give me some um, uh, some information about the ideas that you have and I'm happy to talk to you about it. I just wanted to give, there are actually hundreds and hundreds of authors from Japan who um, publish with Routledge and they publish across pretty much every subject area that we have. This is just a very small selection um, of a few of the authors that I reached out to um, to let them know that this session was happening um, and who quickly responded to me. So I, I, I thought I'd just include some names um, and those are the names of the books that they've published with us. But as I say, there are hundreds and hundreds of authors um, either based in Japan or originally in Japan who've now moved overseas um, who publish with us. So you wouldn't be alone. There are lots of um, other scholars from Japan publishing with Routledge. I also wanted to just mention that there are quite a number of Japan, Japanese focused book series um, under Routledge. So not all books will come under a series, but a bit like um, a bit like with a journal, um, many books under the same topic or theme will be published under a book series. So in this example, Routledge Contemporary Japan series um, publishes a lot of um, sort of Japanese studies um, books in one collection. Many of them have a series editor who curates and helps guide the quality of the books in those series. So it's it's useful to reach out to your commissioning editor and ask for some suggestions of what series might be helpful. You don't have to publish in a Japanese focused book series. It can be a global, um, a globally focused series, but it just gives you a sense of how much um, Routledge is very keen to hear from Japanese authors and how much interest we have in Japan. I think one of the things people don't always realise is that scholars outside of Japan, because they don't speak or read Japanese, there's a lot of things that aren't very um, widely available internationally. And so there's a lot of interest in what's happening um, in the economics, in the history, in the politics, in the culture. So pretty much anything you want to write about, um, given the right um, approach will be interesting to an international audience and we can give you some suggestions of what series would be useful. So this is just a few. 
Okay, so once you've decided um, a little bit about shaping the book, it's quite useful to start thinking about what kind of book you um, would like to publish. And the reason this is useful is because, again, this helps you work out who you're writing your book for. So if you're publishing a book for researchers, if you're writing a book for other researchers, you're most likely writing a monograph, uh, a multi-authored or an edited collection. And those um, are 80% of what Routledge publishes and what many of the large academic publishers um, publish. These books are aimed at academics like yourselves and you should write them for an academic audience. Make sure they're very um, well referenced um, and you can go into quite a lot of detail. You can assume that the audience is going to be um, people potentially either doing a PhD or in postgraduate study um, and who have a decent amount of knowledge. These books tend to be between um, 55,000 words to 100,000 words um, and um, they come out in a hardback and an ebook. All of our books have ebooks and hardback. Um, at Routledge, we're very lucky that we can offer you a paperback version of your book after 18 months. So once the book's been out for 18 months in hardback, it will be published as a paperback as well. So that's really fantastic. The other option is a short form focus book. So the Routledge focus, which is the, um, the black cover that you'll see there with the, with the green um, banner on top. And a Routledge focus is shorter. So they're around 25,000 to 50,000 words. They're shorter books. And they can be really great for topics that are quite fast moving. So something like educational technology or psychology, something where, um, or something about online activity. At the moment, we were doing a lot of Routledge focus books um, based around uh, COVID-19 because the, it's moving so quickly that we need to get uh, the research published quite soon. Um, if you wait for a full um, book to come out, a full monograph to come out, then it, it may be outdated. So those are great for sort of short, uh, quick turnaround topics. Or a handbook. So a handbook, and that's the, the one in the bottom right hand corner there. A handbook is a huge volume, a reference volume, and that will cover every, um, every topic within a certain theme. So this example I've given is the Routledge Handbook of, of Japanese Sociolinguistics. So that will be maybe 40 different chapters on all the different aspects of Japanese sociolinguistics. Um, and it's written normally by the kind of experts in the field. If you get asked to write a handbook chapter, please do say yes, because it's a really fantastic thing to have on your CV. Um, and those handbooks tend to stay around and be relevant for at least 10 years. Um, so that's a research audience. But you might also be writing for a student audience. So you might be doing uh, a course, you might be giving uh, lectures on a particular subject and you think there's a potential for a new textbook uh, in that area. Um, in which case you can suggest a textbook for students. What you need to remember is that you're writing for students and so the academic uh, level and the tone of the book need to be different. Um, perhaps the detail you're going into can be a bit, um, a bit less. You might want to do special boxes or revision tables, things to help students to retain all that information. So you need to think about who you're writing that book for in order to write the book and the proposal correctly. So um, think about that as a student market. You might also have a possible book for a professional market. So potentially therapists or counsellors um, in a mental health field um, or maybe teachers um, and educational field so if you're thinking about writing a book for, for, for a professional market again think about what those professionals might need from their book your book project okay so what do you do if you have an idea you know who's going to um, be the market and the audience what's the next step so the next step is a book proposal. So obviously not this type of proposal. We're not proposing marriage, but you do want the editor, the commissioning editor, that's someone like me, to say yes to your book proposal. And I'm going to talk to you through how to make sure that your book proposal is well received. First thing to say is at this stage, we're asking you to write about the idea you have for a book and flesh out the idea. We're not asking you to have a full manuscript ready. 
at this stage, it's still um, a developing idea that we're going to give you feedback on. So you don't need to write the full manuscript. And what we're asking you to fill in is a proposal questionnaire, which your commissioning editor will send you. And it looks like this. I've actually screen grabbed uh, the questionnaire so you can see exactly what we're talking about. And the questionnaire is a Word document. We ask you to fill it in and send it back to us in as much detail as you can. Um, so the things we ask you, the title and subtitle for your book, this will change through the process, so don't worry too much. But the main thing to think about with a, a title is to include the keywords that somebody typing into a Google Scholar search or an Amazon search um, would look for if they were trying to find your book. So what are the keywords that somebody would, um, would type in? And those are the keywords that need to be included in the title and subtitle of your book. So there's no point in putting something fun and quirky or trying to be clever. You do need to make sure um, that you're including all the keywords in the title. We need to know who you are, a little bit about you as the author or you as the editor. Um, so include, us, uh, include your CV and give us details about um, what other publications you might have done so that we can see how qualified you are to write the book. The rationale asks what the need is for this book, why this book is important, um, that we should publish it. And then we're asking you in a synopsis to talk about what the book will be about. So that's where we're asking you for the list of chapter headings um, and a chapter abstract for each chapter. And that should tell us exactly what you intend to cover in each of the, uh, in each of the chapters. And it should be enough detail that somebody reading the proposal should be able to understand the progression of the chapters, how they link together, um, and um, can see all of the content that you're planning to include. We ask you to tell us how long the book is expected to be. Um, as I say, most books are around 55,000 words up to 100,000 words. Um, and if it's longer than that or shorter than that, we may give you feedback about possibility of changing it. We ask um, for a sound bite, like a marketing pitch. And this is essentially a, a very short summary, about 200 words of your book and what makes it special and unique. What, if somebody picking it up off a bookshelf, what are they going to uh, read on the back cover that's going to make them want to read and buy your book? So if you can do that, it's great to have something that really um, hooks the reader and hooks the potential reader into, into reading the book. Catchwords are essentially keywords. We ask for six keywords. And then if you're thinking about writing an edited book, now I haven't spoken about this yet, but an edited book is where you have um, a number of chapters, maybe eight to ten chapters, written by different academics. And you may be the editor along with a colleague or on your own, and you're bringing all of those contributors together um, on that uh, topic to publish a book. And an edited book can be fantastic because it can give lots of different viewpoints um, on a particular topic. What it does need to be, though, is, is linked. That content needs to be linked together in a clear, coherent way. What you can't do is just collect lots of different um, papers together and call it an edited volume without there being some clear theoretical um, or it could be something to do with the, um, the region that you're, you're working in, it could be the context, but something needs to link those, those chapters together. And you as the editor are responsible for pulling all of that together. So when we're talking about edited books, we ask you to tell us who the contributors are. So um, what university are they at? Uh, what are their names? Is there an international spread of contributors? We want to see um, uh, how global this content is, why you've chosen those chapters and how they're going to link together. And that's really important. We want to know who you think the readers are. So you will be asked to tell us who you think is going to be the main author, uh, the main readership for your book. So going back to my original question, is it researchers in your field um, or is it students or is it practitioners? Um, you can't write a book for all of those audiences. It has to be one or the other as, as the primary market. Um, sometimes I get proposals where somebody's saying this is for parents and it's for teachers and it's for students and it's for academics. Unfortunately, you can't hit all of those audiences with one book. So you need to be quite clear about who the main audience is for your book. 
and then the market. So if it's a textbook, for example, what courses are you expecting this book to be used on? So who will be buying it? Um, if you think it's going to be used on a number of different courses um, as supplementary reading, tell us which courses those might be as well. We ask you to show us that you understand where your book is sitting in terms of the competition and what the uniqueness of your book is. So we'll ask you to tell us the um, who the competing books are and how your book is better than those books um, very explicitly. Uh, the last thing we'll ask is the time scale. How long do you think you need to write the book? In general, most academics take between a year and 18 months to write um, a book once they've had the contract. Um, there isn't a wrong answer for this, but generally it takes more than two or three months and we would avoid ideally um, contracting something where somebody needs more than two or three years because it's just a very long way into the future. So we want to see that you've got a plan to write something now. Um, finally, we'll ask you for a sample chapter. Particularly if you're a new scholar and you haven't written a book before, we very much want to see how you write and we want the reviewers to be able to give you feedback about um, how you write, um, referencing um, the tone and style uh, as it relates to the audience that you're writing it for. So um, if you have, if you can produce a sample chapter, that is really helpful. It's not essential, particularly if you're a, you know, you've published a few times with other publishers as well, um, but don't be surprised if you're asked for a sample chapter. I just want to give this one slide about publishing from your PhD. And the main point here is to say it's publishing from your PhD, not publishing your PhD. So we won't take your PhD thesis and just put a Routledge cover on the front and publish it as your thesis. What we will do is work with you to help modify um, and adapt your thesis to make it a really good monograph book. When you're writing um, a book, you're speaking to other academics like yourselves who know that you're already a qualified academic and you're not having to prove that you know how to be an academic. You're not trying to prove um, that you know how to pick the right methodology. When you're doing your PhD, you're, you're ticking a lot of exercise, ticking a lot of boxes for the PhD examiners. And it's a very formal process and the writing is quite formal. So you can be a lot more free in a monograph and there are, there are quite a few things that you should be thinking about modifying or cutting. You might want to adapt the language and the style to make it a little bit more relaxed. Um, you also want to potentially add some additional case studies or comparative studies to, to broaden out what can be quite a narrow thesis topic to make it more relevant for a global audience. So I've got some advice and guidelines I can send you um, if you're interested in some more information about publishing from your PhD. Um, but this is to say we do work with you to publish from your PhD, but as I say, not your actual thesis. Okay, so what are we looking for? So the proposal will come to somebody like me um, to begin with, and what we're looking for and what the reviewers will be looking for is originality, a clearly defined market. So we're looking to, um, that you have understood who the market is for your book and you're not saying it's for 10 different groups of people, um, that it has either regional relevance or an international appeal. So if you're publishing from Japan, you may well have um, done uh, research on a Japanese context. That's absolutely fine. And in most cases, um, that's really important because that's the, um, that's the unique selling point for your book that is going to make it sell in an international market because people want to know about a Japanese context. But what you need to be thinking about when you're writing the proposal is how do you show what the relevance might be to a wider audience? If you've written, if your research is just um, based on one or two schools in a, in a small area of Japan and you haven't engaged with the international community of scholars in your field, um, then it's probably not going to have international relevance. But if you can show um, the theoretical relevance or the um, it's a broader study and actually what you're sh what you're finding in Japan may have um, either comparisons with other parts of the world or what you're finding shows um, where other parts of the world could be heading in terms of you know um, educational excellence for example then I think those are things that you can you can talk about in your proposal about why your work is relevant to an international audience we want to know that you're a good author 
And a good author doesn't necessarily mean somebody who's published before. What we're asking is to make sure that you are someone we can work with. The worst thing for me is if the reviewers and myself spend a lot of time working with you on a proposal, we give you feedback and then the author doesn't take that feedback and, and is very defensive or finds it very difficult to, to follow the instructions that we have. We want authors that we can work with well and hopefully build a relationship to, to publish again and again. Obviously, we're looking for strong research and we want to see evidence of clear language and structure. If the, the proposal comes to me and I think that the, the English is not ready uh, for us to send it to review, that's something that we'll feed back to you. So all in all, what we're looking for is um, signs that we'll be able to sell your book and that it's good quality, because essentially Routledge is a commercial publisher. We won't take a chance on a book unless we think it's going to sell. Um, I might just pause for a second because I know I've been speaking for about 30 minutes already. Um, before I talk about the peer review process, um, does anybody have any specific questions about the proposal form that I've just um, outlined? Um, if you have any questions and you want to, I'll just pause for a, a minute or so. If you want to type anything into the chat box um, about the proposal process, uh, sorry, about the proposal form, um, that I've explained, then just please do, do feel free to chat um, those questions now. I'll give it a minute. If there aren't any questions, that's fine. We'll wait till the end and I'll carry on. But I, I'm just aware I've spoken at you for half an hour and I just wanted to see if there's any questions at this point. Okay, fantastic. Well, no, no problem. Well, I shall carry on. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. We'll take good. Some just came in, but I think we can take them on later on. Are they to do with the proposal form or is it something? Um, no, it's about some of the students are looking to publish biographies of Japanese um, historical okay. persons. Uh, yeah, so I think we can. Take okay, that no, that's fine. Well, I'll, I'll take the rest of the questions at the end. I thought I'd just pause because. One of the things I find, and I'm sure lots of other people find with these um, webinars, is that you you get a bit sick of listening to someone's voice after a while. And um, I know, you know, it's a lot of information. So I just wanted to pause for a second and just check. OK, so moving on, the peer review process. So once you've submitted that um, book proposal to um, your Routledge editor and for anything that's that's coming from this session, if you've got an idea, then please, I'll give you my email address. Please just email them directly to me and I will send it to the, the correct uh, Routledge editor for you. Um, if you're not sure, um, as I say, please just send me an email. But otherwise, there is a list of um, Routledge contacts on the Routledge website as well. So you can always look up your particular uh, editor. But um, as I say, please just feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to, to do that for you. But essentially, you would send it to the Routledge um, editor. And it's it's us, it's people like me who will read your proposal to begin with and make an initial assessment. And we're not academics. So what we're looking for, as I say, is um, does it make sense? Can we understand what you're trying to um, outline in terms of your proposal? Uh, do we feel that when you're talking about the unique selling points that it's compelling, that, that you've, you've made us understand that? Um, and you know, is it complete? Um, is the English and the, the structure of the proposal there? Um, and we will make that initial assessment. And it may be that there are a number of things that I would feed back to you at that stage. It may be too long or too short. Um, you know, there may be some areas where I think there's, there's areas for improvement. My my aim, my goal is to get the proposal as strong as possible, so that when we send it to the reviewers, your response from the reviewers will be really positive. So. Publishing a book is a much nicer process than publishing a journal article because you get to work with somebody like me, you get to work with an editor who is on your side. We're trying to help you and support you. Um, and we will give you the honest feedback. If we don't think that it's the right, the right um, book idea or that Routledge is not the right um, publisher for you, we will give you that feedback at the beginning of the process. If the English isn't quite ready, then we'll ask you to perhaps go and work with 
uh, a native English speaker or we give you some suggestions of um, a language editing service that there are things that we can do to try and assist you so don't be put off um, because you can get that feedback at an early an early stage it only takes a couple of weeks for an editor to give you that feedback so so that's the initial um, process once that you and I are happy with the proposal as it stands we'll send it to external peer reviewers and that's where the academics come in so we will send it to Routledge authors mostly um, and experts in the field that you're wanting to publish your book in. And we'll ask normally two to three different academics and um, we'll send them um, so a set of questions asking them, do they think that this is a good idea? Do they think that you're capable of writing the book? Um, do they have any reservations about the content? Do they think there are strengths and weaknesses? Um, do they think that you've evaluated the competition correctly? There are a number of things that we ask them. And they will then send us back um, their written feedback. And normally at the end, we ask them, do you recommend to, that we publish this book, um, give, it, give a contract to this book? And normally they'll say, yes, uh, possibly, but I need them to do these few things. Or they'll say, you know, major revisions, major amendments. Or they'll say, no, I don't think this is quite ready. Here's my feedback. Once um, I collate all of that information together, I will then send that to you so you can see what the reviewers have to say. And then you and I will talk together about how do we move forward uh, with the revisions or um, if it's a reject, what you know, what you can do. So it's again, it's a really collaborative process with your outreach editor. So um, that's a I think that's a really positive thing about publishing a book. Um, obviously, we, we feed back to you. And then if you're going to make changes, the amendments will get made. It may go back to the original reviewers or some other reviewers. And that process can happen uh, once or twice. If at the end of the process, um, the reviews are mostly positive, then we'll move forward to the Routledge Publishing Committee, um, which meets once a week um, in the UK, which is where our head office is. And uh, they will assess your proposal. We'll produce a business case to say, we think we can sell this book. Um, please, can we give this author a contract? And hopefully they'll say yes. That process generally takes around 10 to 12 weeks. Um, with COVID, it's been taking a bit longer, unfortunately, because academics are very busy. Um, but generally, we try to get you a response within two to three months. So it's again, it's much faster than a journal, um, a journal publishing process because um, we can get you a response based on your idea before you've even written the book. And once you've got a contract, then you can go ahead and write the book. Oops. Okay. So. At contract stage, we'll offer you um, a royalty, which is based on how well the book does. So we don't charge you any money uh, to publish with Routledge. Um, we will we will cover all the costs of publishing, um, and we'll actually pay you for your book. We'll give you a, a small percentage royalty of every book copy that's sold uh, in all the formats, uh, which is great. So you're not going to get rich in academic publishing, uh, and Unfortunately, it's not sort of Harry Potter or, or some of the big um, uh, fiction publishers, but um, you will get some money. And if your book does well, you'll do you'll get more money. If it doesn't do very well, um, you won't get much money, but you won't lose anything, um, which is fantastic, I think. And as I say, Routledge will only publish things we think we can sell. Um, we'll ask you to confirm um, when we get you to sign the contract, the word count for the book, how many words you think you're going to um, need. Um, so you can't go over, say, 100,000 words if that's what's been set. And we'll ask you to commit at that point to a date for delivery. Um, and we do ask you to try and stick to the date that you've been asked to deliver um, because it just helps us with the marketing and the sales process. OK, um, so let's let's say uh, a year has gone by or 18 months has gone by. Uh, you've lots of sweat, blood and tears has gone into your producing this book, this beautiful manuscript. Um, as you can see on this slide, generally we don't have manuscripts arriving uh, on our desks in paper copy anymore. We have them sent to us in soft copy um, by email, but um, once you've spent uh, your time producing them, uh, the manuscripts will arrive um, again on my desk and I will be the first person to take a look at the book that you've sent to make sure that it matches what the um, proposal was. Um, if there's any last minute uh, title changes, we can obviously have a discussion about that. Um, 
And then that point we will enter the production process. So we will do all the copy editing, very high quality copy editing with Routledge. We'll make sure that your book is typeset and looks beautiful. We'll send you the proofs for you to check to make sure that tables haven't moved, the images are, are looking good. Um, and, and then once we've done all the production process, uh, which takes about four to six months, we will then print your book. And as I say, all of Routledge books come out in hardback, beautiful hardback books, and also an ebook. All of our books are ebooks. Some books, depending on the type of market, will come out as a paperback book, the sort of soft version, soft cover at the same time. Those books tend to be um, books for students or professionals, books that we think need to be bought in individual copies by uh, students uh, or individual academics. And those books will have um, will uh, have a lower selling price. The research monographs I mentioned earlier will be a higher price because they're aimed at a library market. So libraries are generally going to buy those books and have them on their shelves or in their ebook uh, directory for students and academics to use. Um, okay, so that's the book publishing process. The next thing I just want to very quickly um, cover is uh, open access. Many of you will know that we do open access journal publishing. Um, you may be less aware of open access book publishing, but this is something that is um, becoming more um, frequently used in academic um, circles all over the world. And where you have funding, you can choose to make your book open access. So at Routledge, um, an open access book will go through exactly the same process, the same peer review. We will only publish something we think has um, the right quality, um, regardless of whether it's going to be open access or not. But the difference is that at the end, when the, when the manuscript is delivered, it will be published online for free and it can be read by anyone, anywhere, anyone, anywhere. Um, but that doesn't mean that we will just publish anything because someone's willing to pay if they've got research funder um, funds. So there is a little bit more inf just information there and I will circulate these slides um, later, but if you want to write that down, um, there's information on the routledge.com website there on open access. A couple of the benefits um, of publishing open access, both in journals and books is the increased discoverability because anyone can read and cite your work um, potentially, there is, it's much easier to disseminate the information. You can, you know, send it to people on email, you can send a link to your book, um, you know, on WhatsApp, on LinkedIn, any of the different social media um, networks. If your research um, has a bit more, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, has relevance outside of academia, then this allows anyone outside of your research field to be able to access your book as well. So it can allow that crossover between academia and say the general public. Um, it allows you to highlight your work and uh, you, you retain the, the copyright of your work to be able to do what you want with it. But I think open access is a really interesting option um, and it can lead to much more uh, visibility in terms of downloads. Um, open access books tend to be cited 50% more. They're mentioned online 10 times more. Um, so I just wanted to mention that in case that's something that somebody's interested in. Again, feel free to ask any questions, but open access book publishing essentially means um, your book will be available as an ebook freely anywhere to anybody. Okay, last bit before I finish and allow you to ask any questions is about maximizing research impact. It's really important if you've spent um, two or three years um, either doing the research and then publishing the book um, to actually make sure that that book is getting as much visibility and as much research impact as possible. Um, not only for your academic progression, but also it's, it's just really important for the research to be seen by as many people as possible. One of the things I find, I've been working in Asia for 10 years now, is that particularly Asian scholars um, are not as um, willing to shout about their, um, their achievements, shout about their, their publishing um, expertise as some of their colleagues in America, for example, or Australia or the UK. And my plea today is to make sure that you tell people about the research that you've done, particularly if you've put the effort into making a book. And here is just a few things that you can do. 
So post some updates on academic or professional networking sites where you feel it's appropriate to tell people about the book that you've published. Um, include a link to the book page on any social media that you have. You can add a summary link to your department websites, add it to your students' reading list. Obviously, let them know um, if it's relevant what you've been um, publishing. If you think there's something um, pressworthy, that there may be um, something that the the news, the newspapers or the, the news websites would be interested in, speak to your institution's press office. If you can get a press release sent out about a really fascinating part of your research and it gets into newspaper circulation, that's how it can go viral. Newspapers are always looking for bits of information that they can, um, you know, sort of it's free for them. You're, you're giving them information about something really fascinating that they might want to include. So think about doing that. Um, if you have a personal web page or a blog, you can write your article and link to it. You can even record a short video. Uh, my colleague Christy, uh, who's on the call, is fantastic at helping authors to produce short videos um, that we can then promote via Twitter or social media. If you do nothing else though, please do add a link to your email signature at the bottom of your email. Again, we can help you produce a beautiful banner that people can click through to go to your, your book website. Um, but even if you just put the name of your book and a, and a link a hyperlink in your email signature, just to let people know that you've done that book. Um, I think that's the, the least that you should be doing. Obviously, Routledge will do a huge amount of, of sales and marketing efforts to promote your book to all the networks that we have and the conferences, um, the listservs um, and everything else that we can do. But your networks, you're so connected to your networks, um, it's really important that you, you let people know that you've written this fantastic book on a particular subject area. Okay, this is the um, author directions website um, for Routledge authors and all of the information that I've told you today is available in um, booklet form for free on the website. Um, so you can either get it sent to you as a PDF or they can send you a physical copy, I believe. Um, so for example, this one um, that's showing there is about navigating success from PhD to book. Um, so do please copy down the website. Um, if you forget everything else that I've said today, um, then you know copy down that that URL, and that will lead you to lots of information about um, how to get published um, and how to succeed in terms of um, publishing. Okay, so I said 45 to 50 minutes. I've kept to my time. This is your chance to ask questions. Um, please do ask any questions you have about um, either specific projects or the publishing process, um, about anything at Routledge, uh, and I'll try my best to answer it as best I can. I've got my email address here on the screen for you. Please do reach out to me if you want to have a conversation about a book project, if you want me to direct you to some more information, um, anything that you think about after this um, talk that you haven't you know, felt that you could say. Um, and there's my Twitter um, uh, handle, at katiepeace underscore ed, um, if you want to follow me on Twitter. Please do type your questions into the chat box and I'll be here to answer them for you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Katie. Um, maybe we'll take the first question that came from Judith via her students. It's regarding the um, so some of the students were, were, were saying that they would like to publish um, biographies of J Japanese historical persons. Is this something that Routledge would be interested in? Although we know that you know the majority of our audience, um, we would want to publish internationally in English, but is this something we can consider? It is something we can, we can consider. Um, I can't remember the exact book series, but we have a couple of book series which focus on um, specific uh, biographies of particular um, particular academic um, figures. Obviously, the main thing is to think about who the audience is. If it's a, did you say it was Japanese poetry, or was that a different question? Is this just biographies of an academic scholar? Uh, just biographies. Okay, so it just depends a little bit on who the audience is. If it was a biography of of um, of a famous person, a famous politician, um, or something which might be more suited to a general audience, um, then that would probably be more 
uh, to be better suited to a trade mark to a trade publisher because that would be more likely to be marketed to a general audience but if it was a biography um, which focused on the academic um, research that that particular scholar has done um, and it's maybe collating all of the information that they've um, published and kind of examining um, their impact on that particular academic field that would very much be something that we would be interested in and we do as I say publish quite a number of those um, but it, it depends a little bit on who who the person is and, and the approach that the author is planning to take in their biography about um, about the content, whether it's a trade publisher, whether it's something that Routledge would do. But that's something you can send me a little bit of information about and I can comment more specifically after this. I think Judith has just added that it's, um, we can take this offline, but she clarified that it's Japanese Navy personnel and military from the Taisho period. So I think- Okay, so that, so that potentially has a sort of, has the sort of historical, um, you know, the military context. And so again, if it's, if it's that sort of book, then perhaps somebody would be framing um, that person's life with, um, uh, you know, an exposition about the history and the and the the military, and there may be a lot more to it, which um, would be kind of academic, looking at the sort of academics as well as um, looking at their research or their impact um, in the world. So potentially, it could be something that Brownish would be interested in, um, but we would need to see how you were going to write that book in order to be sure. Okay, sure. Okay, so now we're looking at the questions that came in. So the first one, um, the attendee has asked, if I have a PhD thesis and I'm interested in adapting and publishing it as a book, uh, should I be submitting the proposal or a chapter? Good question. Um, so we would ask you to submit the proposal form, um, which I can send you. If you send me a, an email after this, I can send you the proposal form for you to complete. Um, we would ask you to complete the proposal form. And if you have one or even two sample chapters, then to submit those. But what it shouldn't be is just a, a chapter taken from your thesis. What we do ask you to do is to revise the chapter um, for the book that you're writing, which is based on the thesis. So not just taking the chapter from the thesis. So one of the things that happens quite regularly is that somebody will send me um, a chapter, a sample chapter, and in it, it will say, in this thesis, I will do X, Y, and Z, or this thesis covers, and they obviously haven't adapted it for the monograph audience that we mentioned. They haven't thought about how um, that chapter could be modified for a monograph audience. And the way to know how to adapt um, your thesis is to look at some monographs, look at, look at books that you have um, referenced and, and cited yourself, read some of the content, look at the chapter headings and think about what the language and the style um, and the tone is like. They are very different to the very formal uh, tone and style of a, of a PhD thesis. So please do submit the proposal form completed alongside a, um, a chapter that's written for the book that you're proposing. And similarly with the proposal, it should be based on um, how you've rethought your thesis. And one of the things that gives away that somebody hasn't rethought their thesis is that they still have a, a contents which includes 1.1, 1.1.1, 1.1.1.1, three and it's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of detail what we want with the chapter summaries is um, a clear title um, which is discoverable so if somebody was typing into a, um, a search they would be able to find your chapter and understand what the chapter is about on its own so it doesn't just say research methodology or you know literature review it needs to be very clear what um, that chapter is about from the title of the chapter and an abstract which tells us what's inside that particular uh, chapter. So not just a list of different headings, um, but you know, a 200, 300 word paragraph about what's actually going to be inside. And that shows us that you've, you've moved on from a thesis to writing a monograph. But do please reach out to me and I can send you the proposal form and give you some more information as well. Okay, thanks, Katie. The next one is regarding the peer review process. So when submitting journal articles, there's often a bit of back and forth between the author and the reviewer. And, you know, this might become a bit daunting because, you know, to have the confidence to submit the final draft, which uh, goes directly to typesetting, 
So have you heard of similar solicitudes from other authors? Um, sorry, Christy, just repeat the beginning of that. So are we talking about book publishing or journal publishing? This one is about journal articles. Okay, and the question is, um, do we do a lot of backwards and forwards between the reviewers and the author? Yeah, correct, correct. The case of the back and forth and, you know, the, the final um, stage of having to submit the final draft and, you know, are there such cases? Yeah. I, I mean, with journal publishing, it is very common, and um, particularly if you're quite an early career researcher, you're quite an, uh, you know, a junior scholar, um, even the most experienced academics um, will tell you some of their horror stories about when their particular article went backwards and forwards with reviewers, um, you know, multiple times, and they had to write and rewrite and revise and revise. Um, and it can be a daunting process and it can be very tricky. But what you have to try and remember um, is that the reviewers, if they've given you quite detailed feedback, um, then they've taken their time and they've given you their the knowledge and benefits of their experience to help you and guide you to make your article better or to make your book project better. And so if you can try and um, not get too discouraged and try and very carefully respond to the feedback that you've been given, ideally, you know, show uh, in a separate email or a separate Word document what exactly you've done to respond to all the different comments that they've made. Um, and show them very clearly how you've responded, then I think it can make your article or your book project a much, much better project at the end of it, but you do need to persevere. Um, if you keep getting different responses and you get different feedback, then I think it's okay to go back to the journal editor and ask for their opinion. So sometimes with book projects, we'll get um, three reviews and the three reviewers disagree with each other. And my job as the commissioning editor is to try and, you know, find the find the right way through. And I will work with the author. Um, that's part of my job is to work with you as the author to understand what's the right direction to modify and change your book project. And it's the same with a, an editor for a journal should be able to help guide you um, when you've got differing uh, responses from reviewers. But my advice really is just persevere, try and not take it personally. It, it really happens to everybody. And if they're not rejecting you and they're giving you quite detailed feedback, that's really positive because it means that they've, they felt that it was worthwhile to give you feedback. They felt that your article was worth, re worth revising. If they really didn't like it or they thought it wasn't worth it, they would just reject it. So I think try and take that mindset on board of they, they want to help me and try and, and do your best to make um, the revisions that they've asked for. And as I say, it can help if you just provide some additional information about what you changed and how you've responded. I hope that answers the person's question. Should be fine. The next one is regarding um, how serious is it if you want to change the title um, and the authors after the contract? Um, it's absolutely fine. Um, obviously, it would need to be in collaborate in discussion with your Routledge editor, um, but it, it very often happens that um, an author or an editor may change. Somebody may get too busy. Uh, sometimes people die. Um, there's often things that happen between a book contract and the actual um, uh, book manuscript being written. Um, so if somebody needs to change um, a particular um, you know, multi-author book, needs to change an author or an editor needs to change, just let us know. Um, and we'll need to get a new contract signed uh, with the, the new author team. In terms of titles, a title can change right up until it goes into production, until the book goes into production. That's the point at which we have to have decided. Uh, and again, it's something you would discuss with, uh, with me as your editor. Um, a book title is the thing that changes more than anything else. Um, and I will have an opinion, the reviewers will have an opinion, the Routledge Publishing Committee will have an opinion. Um, obviously, you will have an opinion as an author. There's lots of times that that may be discussed and changed. As I say, the main thing to think about when you're uh, devising a title is um, where will the keywords be? Uh, what will keywords will somebody look for your book? Um, you know, if they're looking, if they're going to be looking at um, Japanese military history um, in you know 1940s, you know. 
uh, Japan, then those are some of the keywords that need to be included in the title and subtitle. The best thing to think about with your title is that it's like the shop window. You're trying to attract um, attract people with your shop window and get them to go inside and have a look and browse your book. So ideally something with a bit of a hook, something that's um, capturing the attention of your uh, reader. But now we live in a world where Google and um, Amazon um, dominate the sort of online searchability. So the main goal for a title is that your book on military, Japanese military history would come up on the first page of a Google, of a Google results page on Google Books. If you type in Japanese military history, you want that to be the, one of the first books that comes up. Um, but yes, to answer the question, you can change the authors. Um, you obviously need to speak to the editor and you can change the title right up until the manuscript goes into production. Okay, the next one is regarding um, language preference. Is there any, for Outlish, do we have any preference on American versus British English for the manuscript? Um, good question. Um, we don't have a preference. Um, well, I do because I'm British, so I prefer British English, but I don't really think Routledge minds either way. We're, in, we're an international company. We have offices in the US um, and the UK, Europe um, and Asia. So um, depending on where you are in um, the world, you may have a particular preference on UK or US English. The main thing is that you're consistent. So if you're writing an edited volume with lots of different contributors, it, agree at the beginning that you're doing American English or you're doing uh, British English. Don't you know mix the two within a book. Um, so it's the same with references. You you need to make sure that you're consistent. But no, there's no um, problem with either type of English. Okay. The next one, um, do we accept English translations of an already published book that may have recently been in another language? Um, we can, yes, and we do um, quite frequently work with Japanese uh, scholars to publish a book that's been published already in Japanese, um, but there is felt to be an international market. Um, there's a couple of things that you need to be aware of. One is you need to make sure that you have the rights. You in your contract with your local publisher have the rights to um, contract with another publisher to publish in English. Um, we would also ideally like to have the rights to sell your book into Chinese, um, uh, Malay, all the different languages um, around the world. So um, just check before you contact a publisher that you've what the rights are in your contract um, with your current publisher, um, because obviously we need to make sure that we can do that. Um, we would still ask you to do a proposal process. We would ask you to do the proposal form. We won't be able to read the book in Japanese. So what we would need to do is for you to write a proposal in English that tells us the same information um, about your book. Um, what will be the chapter titles? What's going to be included in those? Um, why is this book important to an international audience despite having been published in Japanese? Um, and we will assess it based on what we think the market value um, and potential you know, sales of that book are. And we'll do exactly the same thing as we do for any other book. We will ask other academics around the world, normally, you know, someone in the UK, someone in America, someone in Asia, and we'll say, you know, this book's been published in Japanese. This is the publishing proposal. Um, do you think there's going to be interest in this outside of Japan? Um, and we'll base our decision on whether or not there, there's interest, whether they think there's academic quality there. Um, if you can get a chapter translated into English so that we can send that with the proposal that also helps. Um, but yes, it's it's certainly something that we can do uh, and do do quite regularly. Good question. OK, the next one. Uh, do you have any advice for authors who have already published a large number of articles based on their PhD thesis? Um, I do have advice and I would like to say congratulations to begin with on having published a large number of articles. That's fantastic. Um, so with book publishing versus journal publishing, you can um, you can reuse some of the content that you've already published in journals um, in your book. Uh, we do recommend that you make sure that there's enough new content uh, within the book to make it worthwhile for someone to buy the book. Um, if it's just if it's just reusing all of the same material that's out there in the public domain, um, it probably means the book won't sell very well. It probably won't be well cited because 
much of the kind of uniqueness and sort of specialness of the research has already been out there. Those research findings are already widely available in your journal articles. So I think you need to have, it's going back to the beginning when I said, you know, think about why you're publishing this book and what it's going to be about. Is there a need for this book to collect all of that, that different research that you've published together and add something more to it? Is there more to the book than just the sum of its parts if you just, you know, have other content? Um, you should also think about rewriting uh, some of that content for your book rather than just publishing chapters as a journal article and, you know, another chapter as a journal article. So I think you have to be quite careful because you are um, building your academic reputation. And if you are seen to be trying to pass off too much research as new that has already been published. Um, it can look as if you're, um, you're trying to uh, self plagiarize and that can be quite um, damaging. So you need to be really transparent when you're writing the proposal to me and say which bits of the content that you're proposing your book to be, um, uh, which bits of your book, sorry, are already from published materials and include the links to the, the published materials so we can see you know how many um i think if you've got a, a book with maybe eight to ten chapters and two or three of those are going to be based on previously published materials that's absolutely fine um but if you had a an eight chapter book and six of those were going to be based on previously published materials unless you're a very um uh, you know a very well-known senior academic who's had a 25-year career and is writing a book which is um your sort of best of uh, their career, then I think you probably need to think uh, a bit more carefully. So it might be the case that you need to um, go past your PhD for a few years, get a bit more research, do a few more research projects, and then think about publishing your book using some of the content from your thesis, some of your published material, and some of the new research material that you've gathered. Um, but again, you can always ask the question and we can give you specific advice on your proposal. I hope that helps. Okay, uh, Katie, I think there was a question earlier on about um, the peer review process and I was talking about the journal articles. You were asking whether it's journals or books. So the attendee has clarified um, the question was not about journal publishing, but rather the difference between journal and book publishing and how, you know, having the confidence to submit the whole book without the journal style back and forward. So I think made any comments oh. on that? Okay, so um, with a with a with a book manuscript, the quite nice thing is that um, you, you've gone, your proposal has gone through the peer review process. So you should have a fairly good um, blueprint. You should have a fairly good um, a plan for your book. Um, if, you've written a, if you've written a strong um, synopsis that has um, you know, details of what you're going to write in the chapters and the reviewers have given you um, positive feedback about what's what the structure is, what the content is, then you should be fleshing out your idea and your plan. You should already have that in place. So that should make writing it easier because you know you're on the right track. The, the reviewers have already given you the green light to say that that's a good idea. If you want some more support when you're writing, you can obviously speak to your publishing, uh, your publisher like me, um, but I would also advise you to not just write your book in a vacuum. You know, there's nothing wrong with asking other colleagues in the field um, other academics within your department, you know, the head of your department to just, you know, have a look at a chapter. You can get your own review process done. Um, make sure that at least one of the pair of eyes is kind of looking at your, your research, uh, sorry, your writing as you write. Um, and then at the end of the process, when you submit it to Routledge, we can do a full manuscript review for your manuscript as well. We don't do it for every, we don't do it for every book. Um, if it's a very experienced author um, and they'll often go and do their own peer review process, they might not need or want us to do a full manuscript review. But if you're an early career researcher, it's your first book and you're quite nervous about um, submitting, then just say, you know, please can I have a, a manuscript review? I'd like to make sure that I'm on the right track and, and get a, a manuscript review done by the publisher. And that's absolutely fine. Um, the only thing is it slightly delays the process because it can take um, two or three months more to get that res response. Um, but I completely understand that that can be quite nerve wracking. Um, but, you know, I will look at it. If there's a series editor involved in that series, they will look at it. Um, and as I say, you can get a full manuscript review done. Um, and as I say, whilst you're writing, 
do please make sure that you're working um, and asking somebody else to to read bits of your manuscript, if not the entire thing, before you submit. Um, so you shouldn't feel alone. I think that's the nice thing about book publishing versus a journal article is, um, you know, we're in this together. If we've signed a contract, we want to make sure your book is the best quality that it can be. And we want the finished product to be a really strong, good quality product. So um, I hope that slightly allays your fears. Um, but, um, but as I say, feel free to reach out to me afterwards and I can we can always have a chat uh, one to one if you like. Okay, great. The next one. Um, so the attendee was talking about how we don't have an office in Africa. So uh, do we have a geographical preference location? Uh, and more specifically, are we interested in cases from Africa? Mm. Uh, we do have a we do have an office in Africa. It's um, yeah, we have a we have an office in South Africa. Um, but I can send you know I can send some. Um, details of a of a Routledge editor who um, specialise in African studies. We have a uh, we have a huge African studies program. Um, so it depends a little bit whether the book is about a specific African context or whether it's, um, you know, about an international, you know, an internationally um, relevant topic, but written by somebody in Africa. So um, there's no issue at all in the same way as people are really interested in what's happening in parts of Asia. Um, people are very interested in what's happening in um, other places that haven't traditionally published very much because these are contexts that people are, are still trying to learn a lot about, um, particularly in English, if there isn't a lot of English um, research that's being uh, published, then those are areas that people are fascinated by. So I don't think there's any, um, any barrier there. What we would do is we would find out where you're based and we would try and connect you to a Routledge editor who's closest to you to try and avoid the time zone being a problem. Um, one of the reasons I work with um, authors all across Asia is because I'm based here in Singapore, I can easily um, arrange calls with people and hopefully when COVID's um, gone away, uh, get to visit people again. So similarly for um, for academics in Africa, we would we would arrange for you to have a contact who's much closer to you in terms of time zone and potentially comes to visit, um, you know, and go to conferences. I hope that answers that person's question. But again, you can just send me an email, give me a little bit of information about the idea that you have for a book, and I can connect you with the Routledge editor that's um, uh, that's most appropriate for your book. Okay, um, I think one of the last questions. Your presentation has already covered this, but maybe, you know, in two lines, what would be Routledge's strengths and sales points as compared to other publishing companies? <laughs> How would you um, summarize? Oh, in two in two sentences, my goodness. Um, <laughs> I think one of the I think one of the things that Routledge does uh, really well is I think I mentioned at the beginning we we have a we publish a lot of books every year. We actually have a really strong. Um, and deep and rich program, particularly in the research um, kind of monographs area. So we can um, ensure that whatever we're publishing has a lot of um, other similar uh, projects alongside them. Uh, some publishers are very specific in one or two, they're very strong in one or two key areas, um, but they don't have very much depth in, in other areas. Routledge is, is, it's got the breadth, it's also got the depth. So you can have, you can really, be sure if you're working with Routledge that you're um, alongside good company of other authors um, who are also very strong academics in your particular field. And so you're entering that conversation, I think, with with a, you know, you're in a good company, I think is one of the things that I like, particularly about Routledge. Um, and I've worked for this company for oh, more than a decade, um, both in the UK and in Singapore office. Um, and a lot of the same, uh, staff are, the, are there and a lot of the same people still run the company and have done for many many years and one of the things I think is the nicest thing about Routledge is how nice everyone is and how supportive and friendly and I think you need to find a publisher that um, is good for your subject area so obviously have a look on our website and make sure that um, you can find um, content that you think fits with your own subject area um, but, you know, start to have a conversation with someone like me, um, an editor at Routledge, and if it's a good connection and you feel that you've got a good relationship with that person, then it's somebody you want to work with again and again. Most authors that Routledge work with 
won't just work with us one time and never work with us again. Um, they normally find that the, you know, the relationships they have with the editor, the, the sales and marketing response and um, support they get, um, the production quality, all of those things means that people come back to us again and again. So it's a brilliant company to work for. And I think that's one of the, the, the real strengths is, is just how, how nice and, and friendly we are to work with, despite the fact that we're obviously a very big and very, um, uh, you know, uh, strong academic publisher. Um, but I think we still have that, that niceness to us, which I think is something you can't always get with all the other publishers. And we care about everybody's book. I certainly do. And I want to make sure that, you know, people who've spent two or three years you know, putting all of their efforts into this beautiful, you know, really important piece of research, get the best uh, service they can for the book um, and that we get it out there to as many people as possible. So I hope that answers your question. It was certainly was more than two sentences, though. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is well put. Uh, we have one other technical question. Uh, do we accept um, specific terms in, written in kanji for the final publication? Yes. Yeah, we can accept. Um, yeah, we can accept any um, kanji or um, uh, any characters or any type of language um, content. Um, obviously, we don't publish in other languages. We only publish in English. But um, if it's a book on, say, Japanese linguistics, then we would very much be able to support the um, the kanji and the the any of the characters and uh, symbols that we would need to include in there. Okay, great. I think that's all the questions. We, we kind of uh, ran through all of them. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. Just okay. looking to see if the email came in. Fantastic. Well, at the moment. As I say, my email address is there. Please feel free to reach out to me after this. Um, you know, I'm really happy to work with you. Uh, and support you as best as we can um, and you know keep the email address there it doesn't have to be now you can still contact me in six months or a year um, you know I, I meet people um, at conferences normally um, and maybe four years later they'll send me an email saying oh, do you remember meeting and I've got a book, po book project I want to talk to you about so you know do hold on to that um, that contact and you can just reach out to me whenever um, you're thinking about writing a book and ask any questions that you may have I'm happy to help you Okay. Fab. Judith, are you there? Shall I shall we yes, end the session? I'm right here. Thank you so much. It was so interesting and uh, judging by the number of questions, uh, other participants attendees have enjoyed your uh, talk and uh, advice as much as I did. Thank you so much. I would like to uh, thank Christy, Katie and our audience for um, presenting and participating in this event. And I'm sure there will be follow up questions and uh, the video will be uploaded on our YouTube channel uh, as soon as it's uh, 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 gone through an editing process. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Judith. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.